one quick announcement before I forget and we get started. If you are a student in the conservation biology uh, class and did not sign in yet, please see Dr. Meyerson after the, after the class to do that. I wanted to do that. Um, this year, in case you didn't know, the Rhode Island Natural History Survey is celebrating quite an event, which is that it turned 20 years old this year. The survey marks two decades of accomplishments in documenting species, natural history, and biodiversity, some of the state's interesting critters, plants, fungi, ge geology, and on and on. Um, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary with a series of 20 memorable events. So we have a little, um, we have a punch card if you didn't receive one on the, on the way in that um, that you can get punched for each of the each of the events that you attend and at the end of the the end of the year I think we're going to plan on doing some sort of a, a prize giveaway for being um, in attendance in as many events as possible and you'll want to come to every single one of them because they're all great so <laughs> please please do that the other thing neat about the card is it has um, animal tracks on it uh, as a reference card and also a ruler so it's handy and you can, you can keep it and think of the survey fondly. Uh, tonight's Smart Pool Lecture is the second of our memorable events for the year. Um, I wanted to take a minute to thank our uh, lecture series sponsors, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I also wanted to thank the sponsors for tonight's lecture, which is the uh, URI Coastal Institute and the Department of uh, Natural Resources Science. So thank you to, to all those folks for allowing us to put on these kind of great events. Um, I also, before we get started, I want to engage in a bit of uh, shameless organizational promotion. Uh, the survey is a member-run um, not charitable, nonprofit uh, organization in the state relies on contributions from folks like you uh, to deliver some of the scientific information and great programming that um, about Rhode Island's natural world that uh, you look to the survey too and we hope to be able to continue to deliver. So if you enjoy our programs and, uh, and our discoveries, I encourage you to become a member of the survey. There's some great benefits. Renew your membership and, and please give generously um, as you can. There's a sign-in list uh, going around the room that uh, Kyra's holding up right there on, on that side of the room. Uh, she'll pass that around. Uh, please sign in and also give us your email if you'd like to know um, an easy way for us to an easy way for us to get in contact with you to tell you about upcoming events and, and uh, happenings at the survey. We promise not to bombard you. We only send out um, a couple of emails a, a month. So um, please do that if, if that's of interest. Uh, I mentioned that tonight is one of our 20 memorable events. Our next one um, will be a bus trip to Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, for the day, that's um, on Saturday, March 15th, so mark your calendars for that. There's still some slots left, and you can contact Kyra or the, or the survey to, uh, to sign up. It would be really interesting. Um, also, make sure to check out our website and, um, and our Facebook page. There's always, um, that's always being updated with happenings and um, some neat uh, blogs and discussions um, on, on what's happening in the natural world. Uh, at this point, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Scott McWilliams. Um, Scott's a professor of natural uh, resource science here at URI and basically a bird guy. Um, and I also wanted to thank Scott for moderating um, this lecture series uh, and, and um, helping to, to bring all the series together. So, yeah. So I'll be brief. So my job is to <coughs> moderate today. What that means is I want to uh, remind you of what the lecture series topic is. Okay, so first reminder, it's uh, about conservation of rare plants and animals in a changing world. And the first lecture series, as you may remember if you were here, was about California gnat catchers, which is an endangered species out on the West Coast, and conservation issues associated with that. Um, if you consider 
for those of you who are students, you've heard something about the conservation of rare and, uh, and endangered plants and animals. What can you do? You can conserve habitat. You can change the habitat to improve it for the species that you're interested in. Um, you can remove predators if it's something that is being eaten by something. You could get rid of some of the plants, use herbicides if it's an invasive uh, plant that's causing some of the problems. There's a whole host of options that you have. Um, but in the case of conservation practices, you also have limited budgets and you have multiple constituencies that you're interested in. So one of the things that we're trying to wrestle with in this, in this series this year is sort of how you deal with all that. And then over the top of all that is we have climate change and a changing world and how do you deal with that within the context of invasion and threatened species. So we had one talk already on California gnat catchers. This talk today is about passenger pigeons, something that did go extinct. We did something wrong in this case, or something happened. And what we're going to find out is what we can learn about um, conservation of, of species from this kind of perspective. So to give you to give the introduction today, I'm going to introduce Kim Gaffett, and she's going to introduce the speaker. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Really, a great honor for me to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, David Bostain, tonight. And I had him inside a minute ago. There we go. <laughs> 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 really um, you know, I'll, I'll start off pretty regularly. You know, what you're used to seeing. You got his BS in Bachelor of Science in uh, Wildlife Ecology at the uh, University of Wisconsin. He went on to get his uh, master's and PhD in ecology. University of Minnesota. Uh, his dissertation was on their reproductive ecology and parental investment in warning doves. His studies went on and went further as they conducted research uh, on the ecology and conservation of tropical pigeons and doves. I'm sure we all wish we were studying that right now today. <laughs> and uh, Grenada and West Samoa. Um, he's gone on to do what I'm telling you so far, you can get by doing a Google search in about one minute. So don't have to, uh, I'm not going to give you all of the details because there are too many. He's done a lot of work. His pre career has included teaching. Uh, he's taught ecology, zoology, ornithology. Um, and he's worked more and more in the world of public policy and presently considers his work to be done in improving and facilitating the linkages between science and environmental policy, which brings us to his current, uh, one of his current, one of his many <coughs> current positions as a senior scientist uh, with the National Council for Science uh, and the Environment. Um, and in case you're not sure exactly what that does, um, their mission is to improve the scientific basis for environmental decision making, uh, something we're all trying to do. But I, uh, I would say in a word that this man, he makes connections. He makes connections between student and teacher. He makes connections between science and policy. He makes connections between the past, we're going to hear about, and the present and the future. Um, he, uh, once he gets through all the academics and the, uh, the actual work that he's doing, then you get up to some of the fun stuff, like being on the, the first member of the Board of Advisors for the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. So again, building connections and building a survey that, as you just heard, is now 20 years old. Um, and for that, we are very grateful for his guidance over all of these years. Uh, not only a great advisor, a great cheerleader in helping us continue to make those connections throughout the, uh, the academic, the student, the, the community throughout the state. Um, and tonight he's going to be talking about uh, something that he's been working on as one of the leaders in, in uh, the Passenger Pigeon Project, uh, which is an effort to use the 2014 centenary of the extinction of passenger pigeons to inform decisions of today. Um, and because we all know that you can hear things, you have to hear things multiple times before it really sticks and lodges. I don't think I'll be jumping the gun. Uh, by just uh, outlining what some of those hoped for outcomes are going to be. Um, the, the lessons that we're going to learn from a, a, a bird that went extinct 100 years ago, uh, which is to promote the conservation of species and habitats, again, making connections. 
strengthening the relationship between people and nature. Very important connector, connection. And fostering the sustainable use of our natural resources. Um, and I think uh, it's a very broad topic. It's one that's pertinent to all of us. I know all of these students in here. The connections that he's going to help make tonight are going to connect you to our next, uh, uh, next era. Hopefully not too many more things that we know of will go as soon. Thank you very much, Kim, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, that uh, introduction was recorded so maybe I can even get my kids to, uh, <laughs> to, to watch it. And, and thank all of you for, for being here tonight. I know there are a lot of uh, different options and, uh, you know, some of you are getting academic credit and others of you are, are just here. But before I start talking about the passenger pigeons, I just want to um, talk a little bit in terms of the occasion that, uh, as Kim says, I um, have the, the honor, really, of being the, the first member of the advisory committee of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And so I want to congratulate uh, you, congratulate us on uh, 20 years, as, as I said uh, to the students sitting next to me, you know, one more year will be legal. Um, <laughs> and back at that, that I was the, the keynote speaker at the first conference uh, 20 years ago when there were um, people, some of you like, like Keith Killingback, who were um, still in the room, Pete August and others, um, who had this idea that uh, understanding uh, nature, understanding natural history was important, that working together to uh, conduct citizen science in the best sense of the term, engaging people who had degrees and people who didn't have degrees together in trying to understand the, um, the nature of this uh, state of Rhode Island and, and in the broader context that this was important. And um, I think especially for the students here, the, the context is important because there are not many natural history surveys. And there's certainly, I don't, I'm not sure that there's any other that is a, a non-governmental organization created by a group of citizens to work together and to develop um, collaborative science, essentially. So this is great. You know, here we are 20 years later at collaborating, at collaborating and, and, and building, yes, making the, the connections, as, as Kim said. The other um, personally touched just in, in um, this, this lecture um, series uh, uh, named in memory of Mark Gould, because when I came here 20 years ago, uh, Mark and, and Lisa were my hosts, and uh, generous, uh, um, funny people and, uh, you know, people with great passion and vision. And so it's an honor for me to be, be here in, in, in this uh, venue in, in a lecture named after Mark Gould. So what I want to do um, tonight, sorry. oh, okay. before I get okay. started here. Okay. The, fans, the fans are <laughs> on. I'm and sorry, and I didn't, I was so concerned, sorry. I'm pushing the other one. Okay, do I, do I need to say all of this again? <laughs> In summary, here we are 20 years later, and it is a uh, delight to be with the formal members of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and the students and others who are a part of this family and are just getting acquainted with the family, but I hope that... Uh, um, you know, with, through the, the help of the older members that we can all be working together in the next 20 years and beyond. So what I want to do today is to talk about not just the, the passenger pigeon, the, the bird, the uh, phenomena, but to talk about what have we learned from that. And so, as Kim said, that there, there's a, a group of us who are working together in a collaborative way that several of us uh, recognized a few years back that passenger pigeon, I mean, we knew that passenger pigeon went extinct in, in 1914, and we thought, 
okay, here's what we call a teachable moment. That an opportunity that the extinction of the passenger pigeon obviously is, is a, a tragedy beyond comprehension. It would be a tragedy not of the same level, but if we just simply let the centenary of that extinction pass by unnoticed. And so I think part of our obligation is to look backwards and look forwards at the same time. And one of the exciting things about this project, this is an, an all-volunteer effort, and it's, it's not just the scientists, as it says here. We, we have musicians, we have artists, uh, there's filmmakers, and all sorts of people, just plain folks, who are inspired. And so what we want to do is, and we are doing, is to, like tonight, try to um, bring back the memories, at least, of the passenger pigeon, think about the larger lessons between the relationship between our dominant species and the other species on the planet. And I hope to motivate each of you and, and you in turn motivate others to, to do something, to, to be, and, and many of you are engaged, probably all of you, but to be more engaged. So this is the bird, the passenger pigeon, the uh, scientific name, Ectopistes migratorius. Anybody know what that means? Migratory, and ectopistes is wanderer. So this is a migratory wanderer. And so several things to know about the passenger pigeon. And I, I very much believe that the understanding the biology and the ecology of the bird is essential to us understanding its story and why it was so successful and also why it, it uh, ultimately was, uh, became extinct. So this is a bird, first of all, that is very mobile. You can see the, uh, um, the long tail, the long wings. I'll show you a, a picture, uh, an illustration in flight, um, capable of uh, flying maybe 60 miles an hour is the consensus on a sustained flight that allows them to exploit a lot of territory. Like, how, how long would it take you to fly across Rhode Island if you're, if you're flying 60 miles an hour? Uh, they were extremely colonial and gregarious, and they created safety in numbers. They also had created many eyes to be working together to, to find food. And they um, were extremely um, flexible in where they, what they ate. They ate a lot of different foods, and they really moved across the, the landscape of the, uh, um, well, up until the, um, the 20th century, really. And so you can see this is the, uh, uh, the painting of Audubon, who always liked to uh, add a little... Uh, um, flair to, to his paintings, but the males on the bottom, uh, one of the, the common nicknames for that is the blue meteor um, because they, they flew so fast, and the female, as is common in, in many birds, uh, not as, as brightly colored as the, the male. And in fact, if you look closely at morning doves, which is, the, as Kim said, what, what I did my dissertation on, that you'll see that the male has more of that bluish gray, especially on the head than the female does. So look closely, because many people say, oh, I never knew they looked different. Here's um, a mount of, of the bird. And uh, I don't know, it just has a kind of a pizzazz to it. I guess you might say that this is you know, a bird that uh, was, was going places and, and was, 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 doing, was doing things. Um, and uh, you know, like, uh, Contemporary pigeons, short, fleshy legs. They, they didn't spend that much time on, on the ground. Uh, they were really birds of, of flight, birds of, of the tree. They were common enough that, you know, this is what people did in the 18th and 19th centuries. They had stuffed birds in their parlor, and uh, 
um, passenger pigeons. And they're actually, you know, there were a lot of passenger pigeons. There were a lot of, um, and, and so there are still a fair number of specimens uh, available, well, available around uh, uh, more than a century later. So one of the, th the key things about the passenger pigeon, and I mean, there really wasn't anything else like this, is this idea, three to five billion pigeons. So what does that mean, three to five billion pigeons? Well, that, this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gross estimate, but a quarter to 40% of all of the birds in North America at, that, at some point were passenger pigeons. I mean, that's, it's just, it's just mind-boggling to think of how many there must have been. And they traveled in relatively small, there's relatively small numbers of enormous flocks. And so the, um, they basically, they, and you can see that the, the range here is largely eastern North America. There are a few specimens that are found to the west. Um, the breeding range was more kind of the eastern deciduous forest. And they, their ecology basically was that they came roaring in huge flocks through this area looking for food. And I mean, think about, you know, a flock of hundreds of millions, if not billions of pigeons and living on this, this landscape and how much food they must have had as they're, um, you know, feeding, as, as they said, you know, that you could uh, have, uh, the pigeon could have uh, rice for breakfast in Louisiana and have uh, um, acorns for dinner in, in, in Indiana. Um, and they, you know, they generally followed a north-south um, seasonal movement, you know, more south in the winter, and then came up in the spring and fed here, and then in the summer um, fed on the berries and superabundant berries in, in the uh, lake states and Canadian provinces. But they were, um, they were wanderers. They went where the food was. And then, you know, the other thing, I mean, it just seems so incongruous. Okay, three to five billion pigeons extinct. How, how could this possibly be? So here's the bird in flight. And as I mentioned, it's, um, you know, it's just built for speed, built for flight. And that, um, that really enabled them to, to exploit this t colonial and nomadic lifestyle. One of their main foods was what's called mast these super abundant crops of acorns and beech nuts. And you've probably all observed this, how some years they're just acorns everywhere. Um, this, not this past fall, but the fall before that, I don't know how it was here, but in the DC area, it was a masting year. There were acorns everywhere. And I'm thinking, where are the pigeons? You know, but they, they, they fed on, on this, this um, they fed on the mast, and the ecology of this whole thing is that by, for the trees, by producing these bumper crops that are unpredictable in time. So some years there's going to be a lot, some years there are going to be very few, but by having a lot of seeds that you can do what? You can pass on at least some of the seeds are gonna survive into the next generation because there's so many of them that the local predators couldn't, couldn't eat enough of them, couldn't overwhelm them. And by it being unpredictable, you know, you can't really build up a local population of, of nut eaters because maybe the next year there are gonna be very few. So it's a strategy called predator satiation. Well, guess what? When they met the passenger pigeon, they couldn't satiate this flock, this, this uh, um, prodigious number of passenger pigeons. This is a uh, computer-generated uh, image from David Morazic, uh, one of our colleagues on Project Passenger Pigeon, who is working 
almost done with a film, a, a documentary. I just saw the first, my first opportunity to see the, um, the director's fine cut a couple nights ago. And it, it's really remarkable, especially this idea of computer generated imagery. So let, let me give you just a sense of what an observer um, saw. And in this case, the observer was um, Alexander Wilson, the first American ornithologist. And this is, it's some, some date in the mid 1800s. I don't have the exact date, but, um, and, and so he's in Kentucky. So about one o'clock, the pigeons, which I had observed flying the greater part of the morning northerly, began to return in such immense numbers as I'd never before had witnessed. Coming to an opening by the side of a creek called the Benson, where I had a more uninter uninterrupted view, I was astonished at their appearance. They're flying with great steadiness and rapidity at a height beyond gunshot in several strata, so different layers, and so close together that could shot have reached them, one discharge could not have failed of bringing down several individuals. From right to left, as far as the eye could see, the breadth of this vast procession extended, seemingly everywhere equally crowded. Curious to determine how long this appearance would continue, I took out my watch to note the time and sat down to observe them. It was then half past one. I sat for more than an hour. But instead of a diminution of this prodigious procession, it seemed rather to increase both in numbers and rapidity. And anxious to reach Frankfurt that night, I rose and went on. About four in the afternoon, so three hours later, I crossed the Kentucky River at the town of Frankfurt, at which time the living torrent above my head seemed as numerous and extensive as ever. Long after this, I observed them in large bodies that continued to pass for six or eight minutes, and these again were followed by other detached bodies, all moving in the same southeast direction until after six in the evening. To form a rough estimate of the daily consumption of one of these flocks, let us first attempt to calculate the numbers of the above mentioned as seen passing between Frankfurt and the Indiana, Indiana Territory. If we suppose that this column had been one mile in breadth, and I believe it to have been much more, and that it moved at the rate of one mile a minute, so 60 miles an hour, four hours, the time it continued passing, will make its whole length, you math people got this, 240 miles. Again, supposing that each square yard of this moving body com comprehended three pigeons, the square yard in that whole three, or sorry, three, the square yards in that whole space multiplied by three would give 2,230 millions. So in other words, uh, two billion plus 2.2 billion, 272,000 pigeons an almost inconceivable multitude, yet far below the actual amount. So as I, I sent an email to, to Dave, the, the filmmaker, after watching this, and I said, I mean, you know, this, this is truly incredible to have this computer-generated imagery, but you think about this 56-minute film that if you watch that whole, in that whole 56 minutes for the film to take place and multiply it by 10, that would be a passage of one of these incredible flocks of passenger pigeons. So it's, you know, it really is almost beyond our comprehension at this point. <coughs> Another way to think about, to, to look at the passenger pigeon 100 years later is to think about the extent of the landscape. And apparently, um, well, let me ask you, but we have not, at least in people that have looked at this, have not been able to find a feature in Rhode Island that is called pigeon something or the other. But in many uh, places like this town in, in Pennsylvania, a town of pigeon or pigeon creek or pigeon falls or um, pigeon lake or something like that, 
And, and these are now part of, they're still, the pigeons are gone, but these names are part of our landscape. And most people don't even give a first thought as to you know, why there would be a town called Pigeon. There are probably at least 13 different um, plants that are named, have common names involving pigeon, like pigeonberry, or uh, actually there are about three different plants that are called pigeonberry alone. And so just the impact ecologically and, and on the landscape. So then you ask the, the question, you know, how could they possibly have gone from billions to none? And so you have to first maybe ask the question, well, how could there be so many? And one of the ways is, as I mentioned, this, this predator um, satiation, this idea that uh, there are so many in these big flocks that just as the acorns were trying to numerically overwhelm any predators in their area, you know, what kind of impact is even you know, a few hawks or something going to have on a flock of uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions, of passenger pigeons? And so in their nesting areas, they must have been incredibly successful. Um, the uh, survivorship was probably very high. The, this, is, you know, this is part of a, a North American landscape that we really don't have a sense now, but just you know, this rich, uh, you know, like, like the tales that you've heard of uh, the African uh, plains, and, and, but in North America, we, it was once like that here. And the passenger pigeons were an important part of that. But so how could you go from, from billions to none in 40 years. But before, before um, we answered, or I answered that, let me describe also to you a roosting place, a place where they spent the night. Because this is, this is really incredible. Um, this is, this is uh, from Audubon, who as you saw is not only a, a colorful painter, but he's also a colorful writer. And so he's describing a, a roost, he got there um, about two hours before sunset. Few, and, and this is actually is also in Kentucky again. Um, few pigeons were then to be seen. But now I want to give you the visceral sense. The dung lay several inches deep, covering the whole extent of the roosting place, like a bed of snow. Many trees, two feet in diameter, I observed, were broken off at no great distance from the ground, and the branches of many of the largest and tallest given away as if the forest had been swept by a tornado. Everything proved to me that the number of birds resorting to this part of the forest must have been immense beyond conception. The sun was lost to our view, yet not a pigeon had arrived. Suddenly, there burst forth a, genery, a, a general cry of, here they come! The noise which they made, though yet distant, reminded me of a hard gale at sea passing through the rigging of a close reefed vessel. The birds arrived and passed over me. I felt a current of air that surprised me. The pigeons arriving by thousands alighted everywhere, one above another, until solid masses, large as hogs' heads, were formed on the branches all around. Here and there, the perches gave way under the weight with a crash, and falling to the ground, destroyed hundreds of birds beneath, forcing the dense group with which, forcing down the dense group with which every stick was loaded. It was a scene of uproar and confusion. I find it quite useless to speak or even shout to the persons who were nearest to me. Even the reports of guns were seldom heard and I was made aware of the firing only by seeing the shooters unloading. So in this quote by Audubon and also Wilson talked about them being um, out of gunshot in this case. But that's part of the, the story in terms of what happened to the passenger pigeon. But you know, how could, and certainly from, in, from indigenous people and colonists that basically every time that uh, 
passenger pigeons uh, came by that people didn't necessarily think about beauty. They thought about food. And this is a time when there's not a whole lot of, you know, you're not going down to the, the supermarket and uh, getting your fresh meat. Um, your fresh meat is, is coming to you if you, can, if you can get it. And so, um, us was this huge nomadic flocks that basically allowed them to, to exploit these seasonal resources, whether they're nuts or berries or whatever else. And so wherever they went, they're persecuted by humans. But populations were relatively low, technology relatively unadvanced. They were shot in the wintering grounds in, in Louisiana. People were in blinds to, to shoot them um, near the nesting areas or the roosts. One of the we may ways of trapping them was to make these enormous nets to, to catch the pigeons. And just to give you the scale, there's, there's a person in the foreground in, in front of the nets. But there are also technologies that would seem to be pretty innocuous. Like, what would the telegraph have to do with the extinction of the passenger pigeon? Any thoughts on that? Yes? Exactly. And so in addition to the local people who, you know, bonanza, um, food from the sky, manna from heaven, the pigeons are arriving, that they're also, they're developed a professional cadre of market hunters is the term. But um, one of the things that, I, I, that I've found in, in my work on this is there's a lot of simplification that doesn't necessarily work. Like, talk about hunting. Well, these people are not hunters in the sense of, of sportsmen going out as, as, as they do today. These were people who were engaged in commerce. They were engaged in um, going out there, alerted, as you said, by the telegraphs. You know, the pigeons are settling down in Indiana this year because they didn't necessarily nest a roost in the same place each year. They were going where the food was. And then the trains um, enabled them to create a market, kill the birds, bring back live birds as well, ship them back to the big city markets of the east. And so you can see here, um, the green marks the extent of um, railroads in the uh, 1850s. And then by 1861, so uh, around the time of the Civil War, that most of the range, or at least the good bulk of the range of the passenger pigeon, was now within a day's um, ride by horse and wagon to a railroad that could be used for shipping passenger pigeons to the market. And it wasn't just the passenger pigeons, of course. This was the same time in the West that uh, the slaughter of the bisons was taking place. Um, people, you know, ship, being shipped out by train and engaged in, you know, the slaughter. This is a pile of bison skulls. I mean, it's, yeah, just incredible to, to think about what, you know, the carnage that literally took place on this. But it wasn't just the killing. And that's, I think, one of the insights that, that I've been trying to, to raise to people is that if all we did, or all the people of the day did, was just kill passenger pigeons, even with all the technologies, the railroads, and, to the, and, and maybe passenger pigeons were part of the reason why, or, or some of these other markets, that refrigerated rail cars were developed. But it was also the nesting and the reproduction. So one of the, the only pictures, I think, of a, a passenger pigeon nest, kind of flimsy, not a whole lot, note one egg. And this is most, all doves and pigeons will either have one or two eggs per nest. Passenger pigeons only laid one egg per nest. 
They would come up to the north. They'd feed on generally the red oaks because the white oaks would sprout in the fall. But the red oaks would overwinter. They'd be covered by snow um, back in the days when snow covered the ground from uh, October through March or so. And then as soon as the ground, the snow melted, the acorns were exposed, the pigeons came up there, they nested. They probably only had time for one nesting a year because then the acorns were sprouting, the pigeons were, were moving on. It takes about a month, um, a couple of days to build these flimsy nests and, and to lay an egg, about a month for the egg, I'm sorry, about two weeks for the eggs to hatch and then about two weeks for the, the young to raise. The nesting colonies were called cities. They were so incredible. And this is the, the largest nesting that was ever um, recorded. This is 1871, in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, central Wisconsin, about 850 square miles. Doesn't mean that every square mile or every tree had a passenger pigeon, but they would pile in there. There'd be you know, pretty much every space where you could it would be flat enough to put a nest, they put a nest. 20, 30, 40, 50 nests on a tree, all piled in together. So a tremendous um, amount of, of pigeons, a tremendous amount of food resources in some sense. And one of the things that the market hunters were after were these fat little squabs. Um, they, you know, maybe six to eight ounces of almost pure succulent uh, fat meat. And so it wasn't just that they were shooting the adults, but it was also that they were taking the young through almost any conceivable means, many inconceivable means. They'd chop the trees, they'd set fire. Um, I mean, you, and, and of course, you've got, it's a scene of utter bedlam. I mean, I read the Audubon quote about the chaos of the passenger pigeon flock, now add the chaos of all these local yokels plus uh, 500 plus professionals coming in there and shooting and setting fire and everything else. And so shortly after that 1871 nesting in Wisconsin, and really around that time, the birds were getting very skittish. They would have very few successful nestings, and at some point, they would try to nest, they would just get so crazy in there that they would, they would give up, they would abandon the nesting colony. So it doesn't take a population biologist to think about what happens if you shut off the main way of reproduction for two decades, uh, you know, twice as long as the average lifespan of the individual that in addition to, to killing them, we actually didn't kill them all, but we didn't allow them to replace themselves. And so the story is, is not just killing and overhunting, but it's shutting off reproduction. And that has some lessons for today when we talk about things, as I'll talk about in, in a couple minutes here, things like uh, marine fisheries, where we, are still commercially exploiting the wild, um, the wild fish, uh, you know, going out and netting in um, tremendous numbers. But now things like marine sanctuaries, places allowing spawning to take place, that can reproduce, that can allow the stock to replenish. So in a certain sense, what killed the passenger pigeon was a market failure. It was an unregulated, market in wildlife that was not managed. And, you know, at this time, I mean, people had no idea that how could we possibly, you know, we're talking billions of birds, they're, flat, they're black in the sky. How could we as people possibly have any impact on this? Ironically, if you think about this, in a lot of ways, this is the same argument that people say now, or one of the arguments that people say about climate change. You know, how possibly could we, as people, affect the atmosphere? 
the planet is so big, there's so few of us, relatively. Uh, you know, how could we possibly affect something like that? But it happened. And so, at a certain point in the late 19th century, they were still pigeons. They didn't stop trying to nest. Certainly every place they went, they were persecuted. There were some efforts to, to pass laws, but in general, people didn't really believe that that was needed. Um, for example, well, this is back before a lot of the decline, but 1857, a committee from the state legislature of Ohio. The passenger pigeon needs no protection. Wonderfully, wonderfully prolific, having the vast forests of the north as its breeding ground, traveling hundreds of miles in search of food, it is here today and elsewhere tomorrow. And no ordinary destruction can lessen them or be missed from the myriads that are yearly produced. But yet it happened. There were efforts to ban shooting near the, the nesting colonies. In part, again, that was an economic thing because the, the people with the big nets, they didn't want shooting because they wanted to catch, catch the birds uh, flying in and out of the colonies in their big nets. There were a few people that probably were fined for shooting near a pigeon nest, a nesting colony. But once they reached a certain point, this whole ecology built around being one of hundreds of millions, now all of a sudden you're one of 1,000, maybe 10,000, which seems like a lot. They still tried to nest. They're still persecuted. But now you're talking, remember how flimsy that nest was? One egg per year. Generally, they don't have any anti-predator protection. The anti-predator is to have you know, millions of your buddies around you. And so the, probably the pigeon just kind of petered away over the remainder of the 19th century. There are a few that were taken into captivity. They did actually breed in captivity, but you know, people didn't have modern conservation genetics and breeding techniques. And so Martha, the last of the passenger pigeon, died on September 1st. 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. And so, as Aldo Leopold said, another heaven and earth will pass before we see the likes of them again. And so this is where, this is the way we can find passenger pigeons now. Here's a museum specimen in Chicago, my colleagues on Project Passenger Pigeon, uh, Joel Greenberg with the beard and uh, Steve <coughs> Sullivan on, on his right. Um, we have memorials to them, such as this one in Wyalusing State Park, overlooking the Mississippi River in Wisconsin, one of the last places where a passenger pigeon was uh, reported to have been shot in, in 1899. And uh, a memorial that, uh, you know, here we dedicate the memorial to the ill-fated passenger pigeon, which from the earliest days until the 1880s flocked to these pigeon hills the migratory bird, now extinct, was so plentiful that its numbers darkened the sky. And, and then there's a thing that talks about the, uh, the victim of, of being the victim of the, the avarice of, of, of our, our species. So what about today? What does this mean? I mean, obviously, you know, for those of us who care about it and think about it, it's a tragedy. But in fact, it has repercussions today, even on our own health, for people that uh, don't know a passenger pigeon from a carrier pigeon from a, a crow. Um, this is the, uh, the life cycle, and I apologize for the quality of, of this, but the life cycle of the, the Lyme disease organism. It's uh, carried by a, uh, a tick. It's, it, there's a spirochete, a bacterium, and the, the life cycle involves white-tailed deer and white-footed mouse as alternate hosts. And occasionally, the ticks, instead of being on the deer and the mice, they get on us. And uh, probably some people in this room have had Lyme disease. 
So what does this have to do with passenger pigeons? Well, there's some really elegant research that was done a few years back by um, a couple of uh, scientists from the Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York, um, Dick Osfield and Cleve Jones. And what they found was that with this cycle that of infection, that a year or so after one of these mast years with lots of acorns, there was a peak, a spike in Lyme disease. So what happened? Lots of acorns, so lots of mice, local populations. Mice increase, mice reproduce and have generations pretty fast. Deer had better survival, more ticks a year later, and then they're, they're passed on to people. So when I first heard about this, I said, well, this is really cool. And then I said, but when passenger pigeons were there, that wouldn't have happened. Why not? Because the passenger pigeons would have come in there, spent about a week or a month, cleaned up the forest, eaten all the acorns, even before the mice could reproduce. Um, there, there are tales of, uh, you know, people used to send their hogs out in the, into the forest to fatten up. After the passenger pigeons came through, the hogs starved because there was nothing left. And so this whole population ecology of the Lyme disease and the, the increase in the Lyme wouldn't have happened back then. So here's a case where our health today is arguably affected by an extinction that took place a century ago. In terms of the impact on policy, Senator Lacey, um, I don't know where he was actually from, but he, a century, a, a senator around the, the turn of the 19th century, on his testimony in the Senate, he talked about the loss of the passenger pigeon and led to the Lacey Act, which as you can see is still a law today. It's, continual, it's been continuously amended to allow more kinds of animals and even, God forbid, uh, plants to be covered by this law to regulate trade in species, especially illegally taken wildlife. Around this same time that people started to put in protection of um, nesting animals, uh, no hunting in the nesting season, Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed in the um, 1918, protecting uh, wild birds, uh, all, all songbirds in North America, other than the ones specifically designated for hunting. And so, you know, we've all grown up with this idea of endangered species. As, as I told uh, Dr. Meyerson's class this morning, that's one of the things that kind of got me into this whole thing, is as a kid, learning about whooping cranes and other endangered species. But for the people of the, uh, you know, coming into the, uh, the 20th century of America, this is mind boggling stuff. The idea that there could be extinction, especially extinction of something as, as, as abundant as a passenger pigeon. So fast forward to today, 60 years after the extinction of the passenger pigeon, Endangered Species Act was passed and now, even 40 years later, while this is settled law, um, the House of Representatives uh, um, so-called Resources Committee is soon going to be reporting out a uh, plan and probably amendments to uh, try to balance the Endangered Species Act. Uh, you know what that means when they, when they talk about balance. It, it's, uh, the balance is on top of the endangered species. Um, so it's, it's still an issue. So let's turn to, to, you know, just thinking about what does this, this all means here. So it's not, it's not just the things that, you know, we talk about rare and endangered species. You can be common and endangered if you're specialized and if your lifestyle, that, things that allowed you to be so successful, the environment changes in some ways and human predators are, are part of that. 
but also that we can think about our own relationship. And so um, my friend and colleague Joel Greenberg has written this book. I think uh, many of you uh, picked up flyers as, as you came in, and there's more outside, the feathered river across the sky. I highly recommend this, this book because um, it not only tells the story of the passenger pigeon, but the story of the people of the passenger pigeon. And Joel is a, is a, a funny writer. He goes on all sorts of interesting tangents and things. Um, we have this film that uh, will be premiering soon, so contact your local PBS affiliate. This is being handled through Cincinnati Public Television and encourage your affiliate to have it uh, broadcast here in Rhode Island. Um, some of you may know the name Maya Lin as the designer of the Vietnam Memorial. She also has a project called What is Missing about endangered species. And um, we have, and maybe this is something that you want to uh, um, have at, here at URI or in the Natural History Survey as a temporary exhibit, that on the Project Passenger Pigeon website, there are these downloadable displays. Um, I think it's seven panels, something like that, that you can download and print from the website, museum panels talking about passenger pigeons and extinction. A an artist in Cincinnati where the, the last passenger pigeon passed has done this model of what it'd be like to have a, a flock of passenger pigeons uh, flying through the streets of 19th century Cincinnati. And here's a, a project, an origami project. Again, you can go onto the web to foldtheflock.org, download a, uh, a uh, paper in the form of a passenger pigeon, and the idea is to try to collectively get a billion, a flock of, of people, a billion passenger pigeons, origami passenger pigeons uh, folded during this year. So lots of ways that, that people are engaged and, and, and that, you can, that you can get engaged. So what are some of the things that we've learned? Well, number one, you can be common and still be vulnerable. Obvious explanations can be wrong. If we just say overhunting killed the passenger pigeon, well, it ain't that simple. So it's, understand, it's important to understand the ecology and biology of the species that you need to protect across the whole life cycle, especially the breeding, the breeding area. And that extinction is often due to multiple factors. So the shooting, the killing of the young, I didn't really talk about it, but at the same time, deforestation is going on from east to west. At the time the pigeons went extinct, there still was a fair bit of forest in the west or in, in the Midwest, but probably the number of spaces where pigeons could nest any year would be reduced. Certainly nobody set out to eliminate the passenger pigeon. It's like killing the golden goose, right? wasn't intended, but that we humans and nature can each impose limits on each other. <clears throat> but there are some, you know, conservation is, is not only a, a story of gloom and doom, and that's one of the points that I want to make. This is a, a different species of dove. It looks similar in a lot of ways to the passenger pigeon. It's only found on Socorro Island in Mexico, or I should say it was only found in Socorro Island on, on, off Baja, California. It hasn't been there for about 40 years in the wild, and, but now it, it was kept in zoos, um, and av private agriculturalists. Originally, they weren't keeping them with the idea of reintroducing them. They just liked to have them as part of their collection. But through uh, management of this captive species, that and, and through careful breeding, that the, the Socorro Island dove has just for the first time in 40 years returned to Socorro Island. It's still in captivity in Socorro Island, but the idea that people are working on restoring the habitat, and within a few years, there'll be once again wild uh, doves uh, flying over Socorro Island. But we're living in a world of conservation crisis. Amphibians are threatened around the world through a combination of uh, climate change, uh, um, disease like a, a fungus that is um, 
across populations around the world. There, people have been taking them, zoos in particular, taking them in in a project called Amphibian Ark, the idea of trying to keep these little guys alive in captivity until science can figure out um, how to respond to the fungus and try to protect enough of the habitat to, to put them back at some point. The nesting grounds being extremely important for sea turtles, almost all species of which are endangered. Um, they nest, you know, they nest in the beach. They're vulnerable not only to predators like raccoons, but also to poachers. But again, people have come in and are coming in to do simple things like putting cages and having wardens around the nesting areas. And so it's, it's an area, it's, we're, we're living in a really exciting time because so many things are happening and things that are really bad are happening and things that are really good are happening. And, and that's really the challenge for, for all of us is how can we make the good happen fast enough and big enough and outweigh the, the, the bad? Another thing you think about the passenger pigeon is a phenomena, you know, these clouds of pigeons that even if they weren't ecological, or even if they weren't extinct, at some point they became ecologically extinct and so insignificant. And so you think about phenomena like the mass um, populations and movements of monarch butterflies and the, the uh, overwintering grounds, and you've probably seen the pictures in National Geographic and others. This year, the population of, of monarchs is at the lowest level recorded. And it's a combination of things. Yes, there's bad weather, but it's also things like uh, herbicides, uh, Roundup Ready um, um, crops that allow any economics that basically are allowing Midwest farmers to be um, planting from fence road to road to road, and not and so the milkweeds that the monarchs require for their food um, is just not available because there are very few milkweeds. So people are engaged in projects like just planting milkweeds and trying to at least keep the species alive until uh, larger scale actions can take place. I mentioned the marine environment, the marine reserves, where um, just like if you just protected the passenger pigeon nest, that you could still be um, culling the wild population today, just as we do with, with uh, commercial fisheries, that if we can protect the spawning grounds and the rearing grounds and not, that doesn't work for all species. Some species are, you know, they, they're pelagic, they're just out in the open ocean and you can't do that, but more marine reserves would mean that you can continue to commercially, I don't like to use the term harvest because I don't think you can harvest what you didn't plant, but that you can commercially exploit wild populations and so, the idea of a national network of marine reserves. And then the policy. Endangered Species Act, as I mentioned, is endangered. You're very fortunate in Rhode Island that your two senators, um, Jack Reed and Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, following the tradition of uh, John Chafee, one of the, the greatest environmentalists in, in the history of uh, Congress, are, are really fabulous environmentalists. And, and they really understand science and the, the need for protecting that. But they need help, and they need support, and they need support in, in other states. And if you think about you know, looking locally, and these are some pictures, uh, for example, um, of rare and endangered species. This, these are provided by uh, David Gregg, the executive director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, that you know, many of the species are small, but they're, if you take a good look at them, they're really interesting. They're, they're bright, they're exciting, um, they're, and they're, they're, they're at risk. And so here's one that, just to make one more connection with the passenger pigeon, how many of you are familiar with the American burying beetle? Okay, a bunch of you probably more in Rhode Island than any place else because uh, Rhode Island is one of the last refuges, especially Block Island, of, the, of this burying beetle that used to be spread across much of the continent 
and yet it's down to just a few locations. Well, there are a lot of hypotheses, but one of the most plausible hypotheses for the decline of the burying beetle, and this they call them burying beetles because they basically they take a carcass and dig it, bury it underground, and then they lay their eggs and have their their uh, their young raised on these uh, on these carcasses. Well, these beetles are about an inch long, and the most plausible thinking in a lot of people's minds is that what did they use to bury? Passenger pigeons. And you know, here's a super abundant resource. They're not there all the time because they're moving around in space and time. But so here's a potential, at least again, you know, a century later, a, a rare and endangered consequence of an extinction a century ago. So what I want to leave you with in thinking about your, your local species here in Rhode Island is that the fate of biodiversity, the fate of people and their relationship with the environment really is in your hands. And so I thank you for listening and I thank you for your actions. Thing on the audience. Please. I heard a thing on NPR about a geneticist who, who wants to clone them, basically. Yeah. What? Right, so... Good idea, bad idea? Uh, let me say this, that I went to the first meeting of the group, and I, how many of you have heard about this, this idea? Okay, some of you have, uh, some of you haven't. Well, it's, it's a, under a project called Revive and Restore, and it's the, uh, um, the brainchild, if we call it that, of uh, Stuart Brand, who uh, last I heard about was in the, the 60s and 70s as the uh, creator of the Whole Earth Catalog. And Stuart decided, recently had this idea that wouldn't it be cool if we could bring back endangered species, and in particular, wouldn't it be cool if we bring back the passenger pigeon? And so he's working with some scientists. There's a um, quote-unquote synthetic biologist, which doesn't mean that he's synthetic, but is <laughs> uh, creating life in a certain sense. A guy by name of Har uh, by George Church, who is at Harvard. We had our, our first meeting of this group that I was invited to um, at at George's lab, and George has developed these technologies to do very precise gene substitutions, and the idea that they have with this particular aspect of revive and restore is that you can take the nearest living relative of a species, in this case with the passenger <laughs> pigeon, it's the band-tailed pigeon of the West, do genetic research and figure out what are the key genes that make it a passenger pigeon and not a band-tailed pigeon. And, and this is based on ancient D, well, DNA that's still available from the specimens. Identify those genes, somehow interject, inject that through this technology into the genome of the band-tailed pigeon, and then you have a what? And that's, I think, the first question is, you have a what? It's not a band-tailed pigeon. It's not a passenger pigeon. I mean, I, I do not believe that you can, you know, with all the power of science, that you can simply, you know, find the right base pairs. And even if you did, that that is going to recreate this wild biological phenomena that once was a passenger pigeon. But then... Supposing they did create a pseudo-passenger pigeon, quasi-band-tailed, whatever it is, then what? You have to think about, okay, so why is it that this bird went extinct? This is a bird that, like we talked about, needed to have 
at least hundreds of thousands of other birds. So how are you going to get from, you know, one surrogate uh, pseudo whatever to 100,000 plus passenger pigeons that you can release into the wild, into whatever wild we have left. And I mean, you know what, I mean, you think the farmers are going to be happy about having, <laughs> having uh, passenger pigeons flying. So I guess, you know, what I, with respect to the passenger pigeon, and I, I said this at, at the meeting um, and was accused of being the only person there uh, in favor of keeping the passenger pigeon extinct, um, <laughs> is that it's a fantasy. And it's, it's, even if you could do this, this genetic reconstruction, this is probably the last species that you're going to want to do it on because you have to understand the ecology. It's ecology stupid. You know, why did the bird succeed? And then what happened? And, and so, um, I mean, there are other issues as well in terms of moving resources from conservation to uh, popularity, um, you know, chasing things. And then the whole question, you know, if extinction isn't forever, what does that mean for conservation? I mean, you'd say, well, maybe that's a good thing, but it's very destabilizing. You know, if, I mean, if this is arguments that we've had with captive breeding. People say, oh, we don't have to protect the habitat. We'll just breed them in captivity. Oh, well, you know, so what if they go extinct? We'll just bring them back when, you know, when it's the right time. So it's, uh, I don't think it's a great idea. That's the bottom line. Time for long answer. Sorry, I'll try not to be so long, but that, that's one. Yeah, in, in the back or on the side here, please. Yeah, um, one of the things that we, that because the pigeons were so abundant, um, that we can actually, you know, they're in the newspapers where the pigeons have come. And so there was this guy, um, scientist at Wisconsin, A.W. Shorger, who read thousands of magazines and put all of this um, into um, notebooks, which was the technology at the time in the 18. 40s and 50s, and my mentor, uh, Stan Temple, and his students have just put all of these records um, online, and you can get at them through Pod Project Passenger Pigeon. And what we've been finding then is we can actually then go back and see where the nestings took place. And yeah, the reality is in any one year, there may have been two or four, or maybe five different big nestings across the, the United States, and that would be it. So. Highly, highly concentrated. I'm sure David will be willing to stick around for a while afterwards. You can come up with uh, questions that you might have for him after the talk. Quick announcement. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. We had a great turnout. And uh, thank David and Scott. Uh, David, especially for the presentation tonight. Very interesting. Um, I also wanted to do two quick shout outs. Um, one of them is to David Gregg, who's our executive director, who unexpectedly couldn't be here tonight, but I know desperately wanted to. Um, and the other one, and you can join me in a round of applause, is Kyra, who takes care of every big and little detail to make these things. <laughs> it's a hard punch. Join us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone else. Uh,